All right, folks, this is it. The final tier list of my whole university life. Who knew that after years and years of proofs, theorems, equations, and just a few sleepless nights here and there, we would end up right here, in front of yet another tier list. Yeah, I gotta do something with that Oxford math degree, don't I? If you have no idea who I am, my name is Joanna, and I have just graduated from Oxford with a math degree. Every year I make one of these videos where I talk in depth about all of the courses that I took throughout the past year at university and rank them according to my personal enjoyment of the course, how useful it feels for my development and for my career in terms of the lectures, the content, the exams, and you know, all the good stuff. I do want to preface this by saying that despite everything that I'm gonna say about my courses, I will always and always uh, believe that every part of mathematics has its own beauty, you know, unlocks new worlds that are very much worth discovering and jumping into, and that every new theorem or proof comes with various new ideas to be explored and I think that's absolutely brilliant. So yeah, this is just for fun and for all of my fellow maths geeks to debate on a little bit. Speaking of my fellow maths friends here, before we dive back into the tier list, I want to introduce you all to Brilliant, who are very, very kindly sponsoring today's video. So I started using Brilliant back in my first year at university because I was gonna look for a way to really understand complex topics in an interactive and engaging way that was a bit different to classroom teaching. So Brilliant goes beyond passive learning. It's all about applying what you know. They take on an interactive approach to everything science-related, math-related, or computer science, and teach you fundamental concepts in a fun way that is both engaging and absolutely fun. Some of my favorite courses on Brilliant have actually helped me ease into my new role as a quant developer, especially their data analysis courses. For example, their course on predicting with probability gave me practical insight into probability theory and real-world applications, which I now use in finance to just make sense of market data, to learn a thing or two about predictors and how to develop my own strategies. So obviously, it's not just about the formulas, it's about understanding how these concepts would play out in real scenarios, and Brilliant does a great job at that. Brilliant also offers some fantastic case studies like Going Viral on X, where you can learn how data science and probability somewhat intersect with social media trends which I think sounds pretty cool. It's a unique approach that helps you see how things work outside of the classroom too, which I, is always something that I was seeking. So whether you want to know more about math, science or computer science, brilliant courses, which are by the way built by absolute experts in their fields, make learning complex ideas feel intuitive and even fun. They've given me a special link that I can give you guys for some free access for 30 days and a 20% off an annual premium subscription. Just check the description down below or directly go on to brilliant Thanks a lot to Brilliant for sponsoring this video and now let's jump right back into ranking all of my fourth year Oxford experiences. So fourth year at Oxford is pretty different from the previous years. The main focus is now on the dissertation, which takes up two out of eight units that make up your final grade for your master's. You then have complete freedom to choose the other six courses. You can choose more and take the exam in more than six units, but only your top six modules will count towards your final degree classification. So I opted for a pretty good mixture of machine learning, mathematical biology, and probability maze modules. So I studied networks, theories in deep learning, random matrix theory, um, stochastic models in mathematical genetics, topics in computational biology, continuous optimization, with a very nice split, I would say, of three of these modules being in the first term and three in the second term. So the categories of the tier list will be the same as every year. You already know it if you're a regular on this channel. We gotta keep it as a tradition one last time. By the way, you have a link to all of the videos from previous years down in the description below, so definitely check it out after watching this video. So the categories are from the highest or the best to the lowest or the worst. We've got could do this forever and still be happy. You feel satisfied when finishing the problem. Only doing this because there is an exam in it and when will I ever use this in real life? Okay, so let's kick things off with the one thing that took up the most amount of time during my fourth year, which was the dissertation. So essentially, I worked on this from December last year until the end of April, so five pretty solid months of constant work. The topics of my this was branching processes to estimate the probability of a major outbreak, so it encompassed pretty much all of my interest in maths in one. A lot of probability, a lot of modeling, statistics, working with real-life data sets, very big real-life data sets, and a lot of coding as well. So what was it about then? Well, I'm assuming we all know by now what threats infectious diseases post public health. 
In that sense, mathematical models are indispensable to guide local authorities to make the right decisions and to offer some good estimates on the development of such diseases. So in my paper, I focused on age structure models and time-dependent transmission rates. I presented both theoretical frameworks for calculating the probability of a major outbreak in pretty much all such cases and undertook some case studies where I ran stochastic simulations and compared results for three different countries that I chose. I know this was supposed to be like the final boss of my university life, you know, all sorts of the ultimate challenge, but I had such a blast working on it. I loved all the research involved in writing my dissertation and putting together all of my results, all my thoughts about the problem that I had. I definitely developed a strong liking towards research, which I only suspected I had beforehand, but now it's confirmed. So yeah, nothing more to say except could do this forever and still be happy. Theories of deep learning, very trendy indeed after all. Well, deep learning is the dominant method for machines to perform classification tasks at real reliability rates exceeding that of humans at this point, as well as outperforming some world champions in games such as Go, for example. Alongside the proliferating applications of this technique, the practitioners have developed a pretty good understanding of the properties that make these deep nets effective, such as initial layers learning weights similar to those in dictionary learning, while deeper layers instantiate invariance to transforms such as dilation, rotation, and some modest diffeomorphisms. There are now a number of theories being developed to give a mathematical theory to accompany this method, and this course basically explores all of these varying perspectives. I know, I know, deep learning is all the rage. It's like the influencer of the math world, always making all the headlines. This course was like dating a celebrity, you know, like exciting, mysterious, and full of moments where you just nod along pretending that you understand what's going on. But here's the thing, half the time I felt like I was trying to explain why a neural net was working by just saying it just does, okay? Despite that, diving into the inner workings of neural networks was like peeking behind the curtain of a magic show, dare I say, which I really enjoyed. The course was assessed by a mini project, so I actually had to come up with an interesting topic in deep learning and write some fancy code myself, which felt good from the pre-established exam zone that I was familiar with beforehand. I did definitely enjoy it, don't get me wrong, but it does feel like all the bases were just breezed through and not a lot of time was actually spent on trying to understand all of the concepts in depth. And for that, I think it's only fair that it goes into only doing this because there is an exam in it. Networks, ah, that's actually a pretty funky one. So network science provides generic tools to model and analyze systems in a broad range of disciplines, including biology, computer science, and sociology. This course essentially aims at providing an introduction to the interdisciplinary field of research by integrating tools from graph theory, statistics, and dynamical systems. Most of the topics to be considered here are actually active modern research areas, so it felt really, really neat to read papers that were published like at the latest five years ago and learn more about the social networks that are constantly being created around us, especially in a virtual environment. Not gonna lie, a lot of the things we talked about have spooked me out, like the reason why companies would ask you to refer your friends and give you benefits if you do so, simply so they can build your social network without explicitly asking about your personal data, you know? Whether it's understanding how pandemics spread or how to get the best gossip chain going, networks pretty much had its all. This course taught me that everything in life can be boiled down to just some nodes and some edges. So honestly, it was like the LinkedIn of my courses, you know, very interconnected, very relevant, of course. Definitely not my top, top favorite course, because some of the interesting maths have been a bit skipped over, but definitely a solid you feel satisfied when finishing the problem. The exam was also a mini project, so it involved quite a lot of coding and taught me how to work with Network X in Python, which was really, really cool, and I really loved that project. And yeah, what can I say? I'm pretty, pretty proud of uh, my little tiny graphs that I plotted throughout. Stochastic models in mathematical genetics. Well, how do I put this? If Mendel and Schrodinger had sort of a wild party, this would be the result. So it is based on the idea that all organisms vary, some more than others, but people still do share some characteristics, which are all the result of genetic variation. This course basically asks how and why we expect these mutations to be shared. The answer comes only by carefully considering models for genetic data and their implication. So yeah, we spend the whole course basically 
uh, looking back in time to discover how mutations arise and are spread in a certain population. So it's genetics with a dice roll where randomness meets evolution. We're talking about processes where species are literally playing dice with their own survival, which I think is absolutely brilliant. It's like Matt's way of showing that even nature sometimes likes to gamble, I guess. So for the sheer fun of watching alleles drift and mutate across generations, like a mathematical soap opera, I would say, this one definitely goes into could do this forever and still be happy. I have always, always been a fan of studying genetics ever since I was first introduced to it in a biology class when I was 16. And it was just absolutely incredibly satisfying to see how maths plays such a crucial role in this field. The exam was also really nice, really enjoyed the questions that it posed as well. I would have never guessed that I would actually have to draw trees in an Oxford exam, but here we are and I surely am not complaining. <laughs> Continuous optimization. So essentially the solution of optimal decision making and engineering design problems in which the objective and constraints are nonlinear functions of potentially very many variables is required on an everyday basis in the commercial and academic worlds both. A closely related subject is also the solution of nonlinear system of equations, also referred to as least squares or data fitting problems, that occur in pretty much every instance where observations or measurements are available for modeling a continuous process or a continuous phenomenon, such as in weather forecasting, for example. Need I say more about how useful this is in machine learning or finance? This course was pretty much like taking a trip through a mathematical bootcamp. It was all about gradients, constraints, and all the convex holes your heart could possibly desire. It was less optimized your life and more optimized that extremely complicated multivariable function or else. The teaching style also felt very much like coming home uh, for me to be honest because the lecturer was also Romanian like me so it was like going back to that high school maths kind of style which I really really like. The exam was not my favorite though, it was a bit too focused on very niche topics but it went all right at the end of the day so it was a pretty nice course overall and definitely a really useful one right now i'm working on an optimization problem at work so it comes in handy quite a bit but hey while finding the global minimum of a function is cool sometimes you just want to minimize your stress levels you know we could all use a bit of that so yeah you feel satisfied when finishing the problem for being a steady performer but not quite its steep learning curves Pun intended, absolutely, like always. <music> Topics in computational biology, I am not gonna lie, I am going to have a hard time explaining this course as it covered a lot. So computational biology is basically the study of biological systems and processes using computational techniques and tools. So it involves analyzing data from DNA sequences, from protein structures and biological networks to understand life at a molecular level. So the course was divided into four parts. It was climate, epidemics, neuroscience and patterns and shapes. Each lecturer would go into a different topic and it would be all somewhat of a fun facts course rather than a very mathematically rigorous one. This course had all the makings of a great binge-worthy series, you know, biology algorithms, data and a bit of CSI DNA edition. It's like, here's how you can use computers to unlock all the secrets of life, but don't forget to debug your code for us. It's definitely a fascinating mix that you can learn a lot from and you can research a lot into various topics, but it's a bit niche and a bit too all over the place for me, I would say. It makes sense that it was structured like this at the end of the day when you think about it, as the exam was a comprehensive project on your favorite and, you know, as niche as possible topics in computational biology. But still, only doing this because there is an exam in it. Random matrix theory. That's the one course that probably took the wildest turn for me this year. So at its core, random matrix theory provides generic tools to analyze random linear systems. It plays a central role in a broad range of disciplines and application areas, including complex networks, data science, finance, ML, number theory, population dynamics, and quantum physics. It essentially goes over the basic ensembles of random matrices and beautifully derives universal results about the behavior of uh, their eigenvalue statistics. So we learned how, the, how to see the connections of this with other areas of maths and physics, which was quite intricate. And what can I say, who doesn't love playing around with some matrices that are pretty much as unpredictable as my sleep schedule during exams? It wasn't really that easy. Most of the concepts introduced at first made no sense until the week before the exams, and it took me at least 12 read-throughs all of the lectures 
to fully get the bigger picture. So really this course was like opening Pandora's box, you know, chaotic but full of unexpected beauty, which I kind of liked a lot. It felt like the Netflix thriller of my academic year where every matrix had a plot twist coming to it. You know, from eigenvalues that dance around the complex plane to universality laws that make you question reality. Um, random matrix theory really kept my brain as active as a random walk. So yeah, it is probably the perfect contender for you feel satisfied when finishing the problem. It was also the highest scoring exam that I had in the past three years, so yeah, so there you have it. This is the final tier list of my university life. The first one whose bottom tier is actually empty. It could either be because I have grown up to realize that even the most difficult courses have their beauty and hidden charm, or it could just be because I was free to choose courses as niche as I wanted. But yeah, it definitely looks pretty good, I would say. From the high stakes drama of random matrix theory to the existential dread turned absolute enjoyment of my dissertation, it's been a pretty wild ride. What's next? Well, the real world doesn't really come with any sort of syllabus or any sort of tier list, but I'm still ready to see where this new adventure takes me. So thanks for sticking around and if you've got your own course tier list, drop them down in the comments and just let's compare notes, quite literally. Thank you so so much for watching and for sticking with me while I ramble about maths for absolute ages. Hope you have enjoyed and that I might have sparked up your interest in a few of these topics and a few of these courses. If you like this video, if you enjoyed it, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel to see more of me for more content like this and definitely hit the bell uh, so you never miss out on anything that I post. Follow me on Instagram if you feel like it for more content, definitely a lot more active on there. And yeah, I hope you have a lovely, lovely day and I'll see you in the next one. I'm sick of daydreaming, I just want the feeling of you in my bed. I'm down at this waistline, right below your waistline, want you by my head.